Oh man, coming up, today's artist had dabbled in a lot of different musical styles to great effect. But then one morning he rolled out of bed with an incredible song idea. And he would take this idea down a road of musical experimentation unlike any song before it. Uh, from an ethereal vocal that sounded like it was from another dimension entirely. And he put his two favorite words together for the chorus and people thought there was this profound, deep meaning behind it, and it meant nothing. And as he created you know, layers of immaculate sounds and off-the-wall lyrics with it, it all came together around a cool guitar effect. That's grand result was a sound unlike anything that had ever been on radio before. What's crazy is he made a demo in a couple of hours, but it was raw and it was uneven. And he planned to finish it later, but he was so excited about it, he showed a New York DJ that he was buddies with. Then when he got in his car to leave the station, he was shocked to hear the song coming out of his speakers. The DJ was playing his rough demo without his consent. Turns out the DJ had recorded it when he was showing it and uh, he played it and the cat was out of the bag and immediately it went crazy. It hit number one overnight. Coming up next, the icon tells us the whole story. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you still cherish the memory of the very first album that you bought with your own money, you're gonna dig this channel. That's what this is all about. Make sure to subscribe below right now and make sure to click that little bell so that you never miss an episode. We have so many cool uh, song stories coming out from the legends. For more content and behind the scenes footage, check out our Patreon link below and also take a look at our, our Vintage Years collection merch right down here. So it's time for another edition of our show, Revelations. This is where featured artists share rare stories behind their greatest songs and albums. And it's insight that you won't find anywhere else. We really dig down deep here. Today we have the story of the all-time psychedelic number one hit, Crimson and Clover, as told in my exclusive interview with Tommy James. With Tommy James and the Shondells back in the day. Crimson and Clover has been covered by everybody, from Prince, to Joan Jett, it just blew everyone's mind when it was released in the late 60s. And there are so many cool stories behind this all-time hit, including a radio station playing the rough mix without the artist's permission. He didn't even know they were playing it. They played it as an exclusive. What happened after that will surprise you. Let's get into it so that Tommy can tell you the great story. Here's Tommy James on Crimson and Clover. Crimson and Clover. Well, in 1968, you come back from campaigning and the world has changed. Oh, yeah. And you step up and you do something. I mean, you have my immense respect for this because the music industry changes like that and you have to step up and do something different. And you did it with flying colors. The pop psychedelia classic, Crimson and Clover. You made the world a better place because of that record well, right here. I mean, what an uh, incredible- What record. happened was when we went out uh, on the campaign with Hubert Humphrey, the uh, biggest acts on the radio, it was all singles acts. Yeah. It was the Rascals, Herman's Association, Hermits. Herman's Hermits, Gary Puckett. I'm leaving a lot of people oh, out. Oh yeah, and us. of course. Uh, and when I got back uh, 90 days later, the world had turned upside down. It was all albums. Yeah. It was Blood, Sweat and Tears, Santana, Neil Young, Joe Cocker. Cosby, Stills and Nash. Yeah. Yep. And the industry had gone through a, a monumental change going from AM singles to albums and contemporary progressive yeah. rock yep. and FM radio. And that's how fast FM came on and changed everything. And so we get done. Uh, and, w you know, what are we going to do? It was just so fortunate for us. We were working on a little record called Crimson and Clover at that very moment. Because Crimson and Clover allowed us to move from AM top 40 yep. uh, uh, singles to FM uh, progressive album rock. And allowed us to start selling albums. And there's no other record 
that we ever did that I believe would have done that for us in one shot. No like question. Crimson and Clover did. And then with the whole album, the, the Crimson and Clover album then was based uh, around the new sounds that we had done. And we were producing ourselves. Yeah. And we were writing for ourselves. And Speaking of Morris Levy, and that's one thing he had this bad side and the scary side, but that's one thing that he did that a lot of record men would not allow people to, you Absolutely. got to produce your own record. We were given you got freedom. To come in, yeah. If we, and the funny part is, if we had gone in the beginning with Columbia or RCA or Atlantic or one of the corporate labels, I can tell you right now, we would have been lucky to be a one hit wonder because yep. uh, we would have been immediately turned over to uh, an in-house A&R guy. And that's probably the last time anybody would have ever heard. We would have been controlled. Yeah. And plus we'd have had, look at all the competition we yep. would have had if we'd gone with Columbia or somebody. At Roulette, they needed us. Oh, there yeah. were no other artists. I know. And, and uh, they hadn't had a hit for th in three years. And so I was allowed freedom that I would have never had and to learn my craft. Yeah. I would have never been allowed to do that. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk about Crimson and Clover. I really want to break that down because your favorite flower, your favorite color, you roll out of bed one day and... People say, what does it mean? I, two of my favorite words that uh, sounded very profound when you yeah. say them together, and it's just a little three-chord progression backwards. And that's really all it was. And it was the fastest record I think we ever, we did the whole record in five hours. It's crazy. Start to finish. And it ended up being the biggest selling single that we had. Yeah. And uh, the Crimson Clover album did uh, three million albums. Yeah, and you, you sold six million copies of, of Crimson and Clover, the single. Yeah. But well, let's talk about what makes that such a unique song. The arrangement, the echo and the phasing effects. The first vocal, the ah. Uh. That was a really unconventional way to start a single. Well, and then uh, the guitar. I, I guess that's true. I I hadn't thought of it. I, it just yeah. to me just seemed a very natural thing to do. But as we got into the record, um, I loved the the backwards chord progression, and I loved the tremolo on the guitar. That yeah. worked. I had stolen that from uh, a record earlier that I loved, uh, Harlem Nocturne by the Viscounts that I'd heard years before that. Wow. And I'd never really heard tremolo on a record no. uh, since then, used quite that way. And then uh, at the very end, we uh, started playing with the fade, the vocals yeah. on the fade. Yeah. And just for the hell of it, I said, let's run the vocals through the amp like we did the guitar. That, that was back when, if you wanted to make a sound wiggle, you had to basically figure it out yourself. There was yeah. no synthesizer to push. Um, so we ran the vocals through the guitar amp and got the tremolo exactly in sync with the rhythm of the music and then ran it back through the board and recorded it like that. And that became, that silly little idea became the signature sound for the record. and then the bass and the drum and that breakdown, that was also really risky. But again, album rock was taken over. Well, we had to make a long version from the short version yeah. instead, instead of the other way around. Instead of editing down the long version, we basically had to build a long version. And um, as a matter of fact, we did that on the album and it went slightly off key because <laughs> we used a this is really getting out in the weeds, but uh, we use what was called a variable frequency oscillator. Isn't that a great <laughs> name? Um, and we misjudged it slightly. Because you had to let it warm up, yeah. but it didn't have enough time to warm up. And then we did our first Ed Sullivan show. And that was a scary moment because, well, first of all, the week before we did the first Sullivan show, Ed Sullivan introduced us. <laughs> uh, actually, right here. Tony Jones and the Spondo. Oh. <laughs> which means he can't read and he never heard of you. Yeah. <laughs> so Tony Jones and the Spondos. If I wasn't scared before, I'm terrified. Now. Yeah. And we go and, you know, they wanted us to do Crimson and Clover live. 
Well, you knew that was a train wreck oh, waiting yeah. to happen. I mean, there's no way these guys were going to get the fade and everything. So I begged them to let me do a lip sync. And they let me, but they said, we want a four track. We want to mess with the mix. So it doesn't sound like, um, you know, we're taking it right from the record. So I went and I made four tracks of mono. <laughs> <laughs> with at different levels so that it looked on their view meters yeah. like they and I can't believe that I did that. I handed it to them and they never knew the difference. Yeah. They never knew the difference. But we had to do an ending. You know, we had Crimson and Clover over and over. Ah, we had to end on a big note. And um, so we did that. We, we, but that was the, one of the scariest. Oh, um, yeah. Shows I ever did in my life like doing Crimson said. and Clover on the Ed Sullivan show. Gosh. Well, I also love like when you do the breakdown before you go into the vocal part, the guitar and the bass and the drum together, it almost sounds like one instrument. That's just so great about how you did that. And then the harmonies and the background vocals. How did well, you many of those things were just happy accidents. And they're, they're, I am convinced that so many of the things that makes number one records and makes these yeah. classic sounds and, and that you think they... Oh, you must have thought that through and did. Nah. Yeah. You know, you just go in and you, and you do it. And uh, if you stay in the studio long enough um, and you have good people around you, good things are going to happen. You know, you'll, oh, yeah. you'll, you, your accidents will be pluses, not minuses. Yeah. So. Just revolutionary because nobody had ever heard that tremolo vocal like you did. Like you sound like you're underwater and all that. Well, that was that was something that... Uh, uh, we, again, were very lucky with because it was just kind of something that was a 30 second thing um, that really ended up working, became yeah. a signature sound. Yeah. Well, you had this elaborate release plan for that thing. You had all this stuff planned. You yeah. go into w oh, WLS yeah. in Chicago. Tell me that story. We blew it. <laughs> um, yeah. Roulette loved Crimson and Clover. We had changed our sound. We had... Uh, we were, you know, we're suddenly selling albums and they wanted to make a big deal out of it. And, uh, well, I blew it. I, I <laughs> took, uh, uh, the rough mix and this is a rough mix that I had mixed with my elbows. Basically after we had done the record, uh, I hadn't mixed. It. I just literally put the thing up. It was a work tape to listen Jeez. to. And, um, I took it to Chicago. Uh, I was playing there that weekend and I took it up to WLS, which at that time was the biggest station in the country. Oh, yeah. And uh, I play it for uh, John Rook, the PD. And he says, oh, that's great. Th and now this is a rough mix. And then he plays it for Larry Lujak, who had just come on board, the big disc jockey there. And unbeknownst to me, they taped it. It taped my tape. And I go back down to the car, I get in the car, and, and I hear playing world it. exclusive on <laughs> WLS. Oh, and I'm. <laughs> they're playing my rough mix. They're not supposed to be playing that. And uh, I never got a chance to mix the record. I go back home and I go up to and there's a funeral wreath <laughs> from WCFL, the other station for me giving Crimson and Clover to WLS. And Morris says, what the hell happened? And so they had to release my seven and a half rough mix. The, the Crimson and Clover that we all know was a seven and a half rough mix. Yeah. I never got to mix the record. Jeez. That's a true story. And the reaction is so huge that you just have to rush out and you had to learn to live with it, right? The, I the, the, the cringed little... every time I heard it, but... <laughs> But yeah, I learned to I learned to like it actually. But that's kind of what made it that after that it sold a million. I yeah. Think. yeah, yeah. I, but it, that's a true story. Well, and, in '68, uh, when it goes to number one, this was in December, and people misheard the lyric. Oh, right? it was Christmas is over. <laughs> true story. <laughs> yes. Well, Hubert Humphrey wrote the liner notes. Ho Hubert Humphrey wrote the that's liner notes. Incredible to my Crimson and Clover album. That was a first too. When, when yeah, did a political was... figure ever written? You know, that's just incredible. Isn't that? Incredible. It is. <laughs> well, Joan Jett, let's talk about that. She covers it and it goes to number seven in 1982. It's her big single after I Love Rock and Roll. And she performs it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. Yeah, we did it together. Tell me about well, um, how you felt. Well, 
uh, Joan asked me if I would uh, do Crimson and Clover with her at uh, the Hall of Fame when she was inducted yeah. two years ago. And um, I said, sure, I'd be honored to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy James. So Joan and I did it. And then joining us was Miley Cyrus and Dave Groh. Right. So you've got four generations of rock and rollers playing uh, Crimson and Clover at the, at the same time. Jeez. It was really an amazing oh, moment. Yeah. That must have meant something. It really was. It was, it was really And then, really of course, neat. Prince to cover it. Prince did it the most, maybe my favorite yeah. version. Oh, yeah. Uh, Prince did this futuristic version of Crimson and Clover just before he died. I know. And it went number one digitally. It was a digital album called uh, Lotus, Lotus Flower. Flower. Yep. And uh, Crimson and Clover was I the know. single from the album. What a beautiful scene. On the movies, it's been used in high fidelity, frequency, pirate radio. I'd also like to take this opportunity to apologize to a dear friend of mine. Well, the last thing on Crimson and Clover, that week, four of the top five songs when you were at number one, Marvin Gaye, I heard it through the grapevine. The Doors had a song and Sly and the Family Stone, Everyday People. I mean, the power of that moment in music. I mean, yes. those are songs that we listen to every day. And you look, uh, I look, you look at the charts uh, during the, 19, uh, the late 1960s, and it's really astonishing. It is. You know every song up to 40, 50, I know, I you know. know. And, and it's what I meant by none of us really realized what a historical time that was. Oh, yeah. Um, and how much it's influenced music right today, yeah, what we're listening to right now. True. So I, you know, the, 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 the 52 years that I've been doing this in the majors, um, has been, as the book said, one hell of a ride. And yeah. I, I'm just amazed at, you know, the nooks and the crannies and all the, yeah. all the different roads uh, we've walked down. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this psychedelic pop classic. What's your favorite cover version of the song? What are your memories of Tommy James and the rough mix of that station play that we hear today and the guitar effect, the, the tremolo? Let us know below. Make sure to subscribe below if you like our videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Make sure to check us out on Patreon as well. And we got that new merch. Christmas is coming up. Uh, let them know that, that you believe in rock and roll. Till next time, three chords. <laughs>